is the WealthNet Market Call of the Week, highlighting investment trends that could affect your wealth. Globally aware with a geopolitical and quantitative perspective. Hi, this is Louis Giannis with WealthNet Investments, and this is part two of a three-part series on the role of technical analysis in portfolio construction and position sizing. And in this one, part two is called Defining Portfolio Risk for Position Sizing. And it's really interesting. We're going to be talking about a few things. We're going to be talking about what is needed to develop a risk profile for a portfolio strategy. Very, very important. And then how we translate that using correlations into three most important factors in analyzing correlation in the markets uh, so that we can make better forecasts. And then uh, number three, we're going to be talking about the framework for effective position sizing. So I'm going to show this really cool chart that will uh, outline the framework that we use on position sizing at a high level. So let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so now let's move on to the next section. We're going to be talking about quantitative technical analysis in the portfolio process. One of the big things that I really have learned over the years is that how much versus what to invest in. So think about that. There's two decisions. How much do I put in versus what do I put my money into? what's more important. And if you look at the actual math of it, they're actually pretty equally important because the, the contribution of an investment to a portfolio's return is simply the weight or how much you put into something multiplied times its return, basically what the return of what you invest in. So they're equally important. We always talk about return, 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 but how much do you hear people talking about how much, how much, how much? I really think we need to talk more about how much. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, because how much is just as important as what to put your money into. So what we see here in this graphic is our position size protocols from a high level. So basically, I'm going to walk you through this graph on the left that shows from a high level what it is that we're doing to determine how much we're going to put into something. Okay, the first starting on the top left is the opportunity. So we have a method of dealing with opportunity. What is the quality? What is the valuation? And what are the technicals or trends? So relative performance sentiment, those types of things, value and technical. So what is the opportunity? What is more attractive? What is less attractive? Okay, then we bring that down. And that tells us how much of our risk budget that we're going to employ towards a particular opportunity. So if you have a high opportunity score or rating, then we're going to want to employ more of our risk budget that we have established. We have a total risk budget that we've established. We're going to put more in if we have a higher opportunity. And then we also have on the other side to the right there, our risk assessment. So Whatever our risk assessment tells us, that tells us what our risk budget's going to be. So basically something that has more risk, that means we can put less capital into it for it to have the impact because we don't want to have any one thing have too much impact to hurt our results. So if you have a higher risk investment, it has a lower risk budget. If you have a lower risk investment, it has a higher risk budget, if that makes sense. Risk budget meaning percentage of capital that you can put employ into it. All right. So once we've looked at those two things, then we look at diversification effects. So so we have this return risk expectation, and then we look at what are the diversification effects of, of adding this to our portfolio, subtracting it from our portfolio. And then we get our target weights, and then we apply some constraints to it, and then we get our actual weights and our target weights, and we compare them. And when those are drift too much, then we have tra uh, trading actions. So trading actions can happen for many different reasons. And I'm going to go over those, or I should say several reasons. I'm going to go over those reasons as well. But this is the high level of what I'm going to be talking about. So step one is to define your portfolio risk. And we want to start off with the universal portfolio goal, which is to maximize your return per unit of risk, given your constraints, like your time horizon, your liquidity, et cetera, and your income requirements. Because that is really what a rational investor would do. So we have to start off with that. We need that before we can actually define risk budgets at the individual instrument level or at the group level. So we start off with that. And what is needed to do that? We need a few things. The first thing we need is we need to know what our target is. Is it going to be a relative target? Meaning, is it relative to some index like the S&P 500 or... Um, some other kind of index, or is it uh, a target volatility number like 12% uh, volatility or 9% volatility? Or is it some maximum drawdown number like it, we don't want to see a drawdown, we want to keep our drawdowns most of the time within minus 
20% or minus 15%, something like that. So we need to know what that is. We also need to know our time frame of our strategy. So we need to know our time frame so that we can actually match our volatility and our sizing to the volatility over that time frame. We also need to know, know what universe of instruments that we're going to be using. Are we going to use stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies? We need to know that because that has a lot to do with the amount of diversification benefits that we can achieve. So we start off with defining it. And once we've done that, once we have that those three things that we talked about, then we need to know or we need to define what that total risk budget is. And that will be defined as the maximum downside risk the investor is willing to assume you know, that specific measure, whether it's maximum drawdown, standard deviation, whatever that is. And from there, then we can drop it down into risk units. And the risk units are the percentage of the total risk budget that we're going to allocate per opportunity. And we can define that at the group level and at the individual instrument level. Now, what this chart does is just show you what a maximum drawdown is, because sometimes people don't know what maximum drawdown is. So I just thought I'd do a quick chart here to show what that is. This is the S&P 500 going back from 1997. And this only goes through 2015. I just want to illustrate a point. You know, you have these big peak to peak to trough falls. And that's what a drawdown is. It's, you know, from that peak that you see down to the draw, drawdown to the lowest point, what is that peak to trough percentage change. And you can see that, you know, in 2000, we saw a huge drop. Uh, in 2007, 2009, we saw a huge drop. And the recovery period is how long it takes for you to get back to even. And it could be a number of years, you know, 6.7 years in 2000, 4.95 years. That's a really important thing to, to, to keep in mind. The longer the drawdown, the harder it is. Now, we're still defining our portfolio risk. We're still in step one. And I want to point out this magic formula. It's the formula of expectation because this formula really defines the big levers that determine our position sizing. And those big levers are the percentage of time that we make a decision where we're right. So every time we make a decision, what percentage of those are likely to be right? And then what percentage are likely to be wrong? And then also how much money are we going to make when we're right versus we're going to lose when we're wrong? Those numbers, when you put them together in this formula, percentage win times dollar win minus percentage loss times dollar loss, that gives us our expectation. Now, this formula applies to any investor, any trader. These are the magic formulas that really determine how well you're going to do. Now, the key is, is to understand this formula. If you look at it, really, it's important that you really want to minimize the right-hand side of that equation, you know, the dollar, how much you lose, basically, and uh, how much you win is is also the inverse of that. So you really need to know, how can I manage my risk? That's it. I keep pounding that in because managing risk is so important. And the, really, the question becomes is how accurate do I need to be or do you need to be to be a successful investor? The answer may actually um, surprise some people because it really depends on your style. There are many investors that do exceptionally well with lower percentage accuracies. They just manage the risk better and they try to really press the investment and make more when they're making money. Uh, and what this graph shows here is the really how much you need to win when you're right and how you can truncate your losses. So basically it's the break even reward risk ratio. So the reward risk ratio is basically how much you make versus when you win versus when you lose right? It's a ratio. So what does that ratio need to be given certain percent accuracies, you know, how often you're right on a percent basis for in order for you to break even. So like, at what point do you break even? And the point here is that if you have a 50 50 chance of being right, that your reward risk ratio needs to be at least one for you to break even. And above that is all gravy, that's profit. Now you could also be only right 20% of the time and have a four to one reward risk ratio when you break even. So it goes to, it goes to show you can have, you know, many, many of the most successful traders have large reward risk ratios and they're, and they're wrong a lot. So it's not necessarily that I need to be the most accurate trader. It's really making sure that you don't lose a lot and you press your winners. Okay. So still in step one, defining portfolio risk, I want to just define a couple of terms. The first term is 
capital employed. And what that is, is that's, you know, in our world, that is the percentage of your overall capital that you're investing that you put into investment opportunity. So that would be the dollars you put into an, an investment position divided by the total portfolio value. So that's just a percentage of dollars or currency, whatever currency you're trading that you have in there. So that's one measure. The other measure is the capital at risk, which is the number that we tend to focus in on. The capital at risk is the percentage of your total capital that you are willing to lose in any given opportunity. It's a fraction of your capital employed unless you let it go to zero. So let me explain that a little bit. If you just decide to, that I'm going to put my money into this, if it goes to zero, fine, I'm going to let it go to zero. I'm just going to stick to it until the bitter end. And then, then you would basically be losing 100% of your capital employed which would be equal to your capital at risk. So if you put 1% of your capital into something and you let it go to zero, you lose 1% of your capital. Now, if you only let it lose half of your, your capital employed, then you'll lose 0.5% of your total capital. So I hope that's making some sense, but we really want to defend the differentiate between capital employed, how much cash or capital you're putting into it as a percent of your overall portfolio versus how much you're willing to lose in each ind individual opportunity. So what does that what does that really insinuate? And it insinuates that you need to predefine your risk because you need to predefine your risk in order for you to have a, a, a percentage of capital target that you're willing to risk. OK, so now I want to talk about these big levers. We talked about the magic formula. And what does that mean for position size? Well, it's a function of your hit rate, which is the percentage times that you're right versus your reward risk ratio of your signals, of your technical indicators or your fundamental indicators, wherever your process is, how often is that, what is your reward risk ratio of that? And the, your position size really should be relative to that, given your risk profile, okay? Now I'm gonna kind of drill that down a little bit more because we actually need to, to, to look at it from the standpoint of, we are going to have consecutive losers. We're going to have, you know, such times when you're just going to be wrong more often. Okay. And so that you could use that as a proxy to determine your maximum drawdown. And so what this table does is it shows kind of a hypothetical trader that let's say in his career, he has a hundred thousand trades and he's right 60% of the time and he's wrong 40% of the time. So he has a really good, I would consider that a good percent or hit ratio. Now, what percentage of his capital should he risk if he wants to maximum drawdown to be within 25%? Well, at the 99th percentile, uh, at 25%, I should say, at the 99th percentile, 25%, he shouldn't risk more than 1.39% of capital. So, you, you know, that's kind of the thought process that you want to go through. This is just using Bayesian statistics, you know, given a normal distribution you know, what is the probability of having consecutive losers? You know, you can have at the 99th percent centile, you know, even if you're right 60% of the time, you still have a probability that you could lose 18 times in a row. So that's something to keep in mind. And you, when, you know, and the reality is, is markets aren't normally distributed. So you have serial, serial correlation and you have uh, kind of bunches of returns going down. And we've already talked about that. So, so this is just gives you kind of a proxy to think about in general, most strategies should risk, risk a fraction of 1% to maximum 2% of capital uh, before the portfolio really gets out of control from a risk perspective. All right, so now let's move on to step two, quantitative technical indicators. And now we're going to talk about the inputs of how technical analysis can help in the portfolio process. And we're really going to talk about the three main areas. First is return. So we want to have indicators that are going to uh, really help us understand the probability of having a good return or less than average return. And we can use that with trend, momentum, relative strength, sentiment, patterns, other things. So we have these types of patterns that we can look at and technical trends that we can look at to help with forecasting return. And then we also have uh, data sources that we use. Is it the primary technical data sources like price and volume? Or is it like secondary data choices like uh, like open interest or like uh, uh, option uh, premiums or polls, other non-price volume data sets? So, you know, we want to diversify across that. And we also want to diversify across time frame. So we have our return indicators that need to be diversified. And then we want to have indicators that help us with risk in terms of uh, looking at probabilities for downside volatility or changes in volatility, rising or falling, um, you know, overbought, oversold condition type in indicators. 
And, and lastly, we want to have diversification type indicators that look at intermarket relationships and correlation between uh, groups, as well as re regime changes, general stock market models, things like that. Technical analysis is uniquely uh, a discipline that is uniquely really positioned to help in all of these areas. So that's, that's really what we should be doing as technicians. And the goal is to develop effective models that have low correlation factors or technical indicators, if you will, that we can add to our process, add to the fundamentals, add to the macro, and, and we can have them talk to each other. And that's really the key uh, uh, point that I have in this presentation. So again, just from a graphical perspective, you could see here the multi-factor technical models could be really viewed from having diversification among time frame, among data types, and among types of indicators, what we're measuring. And we want to have diversification across those to give us a more robust read on our, our three main inputs to our models for our portfolio, which is risk, return, and correlation. Okay, so now I want to go ahead and just summarize what we've talked about. We've talked about what is needed to develop a risk profile for a portfolio strategy, how we actually need a total risk budget looking at whatever metrics that make the most sense for us, and then how we can actually drill that down into risk budgets for our position sizing. And we talked about how we can take that and look at the correlations and the risk factors, look at, look at our opportunity scores and our risk scores, and develop a risk budget and how much we should actually allocate in each position. And last we talked about really a general framework about uh, a pr kind of a protocol or a routine on how we can look at the whole picture of position sizing. I hope you got some benefit from that. So this is Lewis Janus for Wealthnet Investments Market Call of the Week. If you like this information, be sure to look us up on Twitter, go to our website at wealthnetinvest.com and follow us and get these market calls delivered to your inbox if you like them. So uh, happy trading and investing and we'll see you next time. If you like this information, be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. The market calls are designed for informational purposes and should not be considered investments advice. As always, do your homework, assess the risk, and invest in light of your personal goals.